How's it going, folks? Welcome along to the channel. It's time for the Monday Agenda. We've got loads to talk about this morning, so let's get straight into it. All right, it is Monday, so it's time for the Monday agenda. And on today's agenda, we're talking about the 6-0 win over Livingston yesterday. We're talking about the Eddie Howe delay, and we're looking ahead to the Derby this weekend. If you do like these videos and you're not subscribed yet, just hit the subscribe button below and you get notified every single time a video goes live. So let's start with the 6-0 win against Livingston yesterday. So this was clearly a brilliant performance from Celtic, one of the best performances of the year and I do think it's down to one man in particular and that's Moyel Yanusi. We spoke about him on the Huddle Breakdown last week and we identified him as somebody who now has a clear defined role in the team and he knows how to do it and he's doing it brilliantly and I think that showed yesterday. It showed sparks of it in the Rangers game, John Kennedy's first game really taking charge of a, of a big clash for Celtic in that derby match. And Moya Lunusi tore them to shreds down that left side for about 20 minutes or so. And I think that's exactly what we've seen him now doing again against Livingston, against a much worse side. And you see the results. He's He was absolutely phenomenal yesterday. So I do think going into the rest of the season, going into the Scottish Cup tie against uh, Rangers this weekend, and just finishing off the season with this Moya Lunusi, not the one that we've seen earlier in the season where you know, he was inconsistent, he was all over the place, he didn't have a defined role, he was playing up front one minute, he was playing number 10 the next, he was playing out in the wing at points two. This is the Moyel Yunusi you want. He's playing off the striker and he's getting goals, he's getting assists, he's really, really dangerous. The problem is now he's probably just paying so that he can leave the club, essentially. He is probably just playing his way out of the club at the minute. So that's the one downside to Moyel Yunusi's form at the minute, but the upside is that obviously he brings to the table something completely different. And another man who brings something completely different to the table is James Forrest. Now, we've seen him. He got a goal in his first match back last week. And again, he got a goal in this game, got the opening goal of the match. And James Forrest is a man that I think the Celtic have missed really, really badly. And the reason for that is not that James Forrest is the best player in the league, not that James Forrest is Cristiano Ronaldo, but he just brings something different to the table that we have been missing all year round. If you think it back to when Jeremy Frimpong was playing, when he was playing as a right winger, Jeremy Frimpong is not a right winger. He's a right wing back. James Forrest would have provided a player who knows how to play that position, who can get to the byline, get crosses in, get good crosses in, first of all. And secondly, if he's not getting to the byline, he has evolved his game a little bit and he is cutting in now on his left foot and getting some goals. And that's what Celtic have really, really missed this year. So it's great to see that James Forrest is back now, not going to get blown away with a 6-0 win over Livingston. Again, Livingston were fifth in the table going into this, and Celtic were heavy favourites. But why did it take this long for Celtic to put these performances in? And I have been critical of John Kennedy since he came out, take, took over because there hasn't been that much change. But I think now that he has had time to work with these players, the international break obviously helped. His sort of plan, his game plan, his elements are starting to come together, and we're starting to see what this Celtic side are actually capable of doing. Because if you compare this game, the 6-0 game, to the two games against Livingston that we had uh, in the course of four days and how dreadful they were compared to this, it's chalk and cheese in terms of the performances. Celtic were much, much better, look much clearer, defined as a team. They look like they know what they're doing. And it just it gives me a little bit of hope going into the derby. This is the most confident that I've been going into a game against Rangers all season. So I do think good confidence builder going into the derby and hopefully we can build on that and just enjoy watching Celtic until the end of the year because really with the league over and potentially the Scottish Cup over this year, all I want to do is enjoy watching Celtic, something I haven't been able to do all year. So I really, really hope this is a sign of the team improvement until the end of the season at least and until the new manager comes in. And that's where we move on to number two, the Eddie Howe delay and what is going on with this management situation. So there's a couple of ways that you can look at this Howe situation. So I'm, I'm going to touch on a couple of them. So the first one I would say is that, you know, there's probably a delay in the fact that just getting it over the table, maybe he doesn't want to take over until the end of the season. Maybe he 
sees the situation and sees that it's an un- unwinnable one if Celtic are knocked out by uh, Rangers in the Scottish Cup, for example, if Eddie Howe had already taken over the side and then they play the diary game, he's already going to get the blame for that. He's already involved in this sort of shit show of a season if he takes over. Now, granted, I do see the argument against that as well in him taking over. I do see the point in him taking over and getting to know the players and almost convincing maybe players who are thinking about leaving to stay like Christopher Iyer. He's obviously not going to stop at Odds and Edward going. I don't think anybody is at this point. But the players who might be willing to stay for Eddie Howe may not be willing to stay if he's not there. So that's the argument for him coming over. But I do think there is question marks over whether he would want to be associated with this season at all. So that's number one. And that's the first reason why I think he might not be coming over. The second one is a little bit more worrying. And that would be if the club's direction or the club's structure is not something that he wants to get involved in. So what I mean by that is, so the likes of Fergal Harkin, who's apparently taken over as director of football, when that happens what's going to happen within the structure of the club? Is he going to have power? And I know Juco James has been really vocal on this on the podcast and on his Twitter as well about the fact that Eddie Howe is not a manager that usually plays under a director of football. He wants full charge of what's going on. He wants full charge of the transfers. And if that's the issue, then that's a little bit more worrying because we do need someone to come in who's going to be involved in that structure, who's going to get, who's going to go with it. <clears throat> Not that he's going to be a pushover, but somebody who is willing to help modernize the club and trust the people involved, trust the people in those positions to make good decisions. And I I get why a manager would be sort of weary about that because ultimately the manager gets sacked if the director of football makes terrible decisions, if the chief scout brings in the wrong players. But that's where... The structure is going. That's where most clubs are going. That's where all the better clubs, all the clubs that are punching above their weight are doing it under this structure. So I don't think it's Eddie Howe or Bust. I think we're so desperate to get a manager at the minute that people are thinking it's Eddie Howe or nothing. And I don't agree with that. I think there are other people out there. And if it takes a little bit longer to get the right man in charge, who's going to be involved in the structure and not hold the club back for another five six years because let's face it Eddie Howe could come in and could be brilliant but if he doesn't get involved in the structure if he doesn't doesn't get involved in the restructuring of the club with the director of football with the chief scout with coaching staff coming in with analytical staff coming in if he doesn't get involved in any of that and then he fucks off in four years we're stuck in the exact same position as we were when Brendan Rodgers upped and left left the club so I don't think it's Eddie Howe bust, but I would like to see Eddie Howe coming in and getting involved in that structure. Hopefully, it'll get over the line. And then the third scenario that potentially could be going on, let's face it, he could be looking for a bigger move or a a bigger money move, should I say, to a Premier League club. So the clubs that he's been linked with at the minute are Crystal Palace, mainly, and Newcastle. Steve Bruce likely out the door, but Newcastle could go down to the Championship, so that would be an absolute stepping stone in his career if he went to a championship club crystal palace the uh obviously roy hudson is getting on in age and there is rumors that he's going to retire at this at the end of the season and i wouldn't be insulted by the fact that he wants to go to crystal palace and i i just want to explain myself a little bit because i do feel like a lot of celtic fans would be insulted and would be wondering why he's going to a relegation candidate club or a mid-table premier league club you get 95 million pounds for finishing 17th in the premier league that is 90 million more than you get for winning the SPFL. And obviously that money's not going in Eddie Howe's pocket. But if you think about what that 95 million means, that means you can bring in players on a bigger budget. You can bring in, bring on players that need higher wages. And also you will get a higher wage for managing that side. So as a career path, if you compare it to any other career path in the world, if the situation is better money-wise for you to do your job better, for you to bring in people who are going to do help you do your job better. And if you're going to get paid better, then you're going to go to that club. It doesn't matter about prestige. It doesn't matter about anything else. The money talks and it's not prestige that's talking, it's money. And if you think about it in the sense of David Moyes, for example, who's managing West Ham, West Ham were a relegation club when he took over the club. He has them now fighting for a Champions League spot. And David Moyes is an excellent manager. 
who has taken a long time to get back his reputation from where it was after Manchester United. But he didn't do that magically out of his own will and survival to get back to that position. He did it by being, firstly, a really good manager, but secondly, he had budget behind him. He was able to bring in Jesse Lingard, who's on massive wages at Manchester United, and he was able to build a club with money to get them back into this position. And somebody, and and now look at David Moyes, whose reputation is now restored. If Eddie Howe is looking at him as an example, he could say, if I get Crystal Palace, they have a really good bunch of squads or players there, and they've got good, got a good budget as well. So I could build something there and I could get them up there. And then he could move on to an even bigger club than he would do with Celtic. So I do think there is logic behind that. And we do have to understand that. And again, as I said, it's not David, it's not Eddie Howe or Bust. There are other people out there. And I do think that we need to just step back, calm down a little bit. The manager, we will not be going into the next season without a manager. And if anybody wants to clip that, please do and tag me if we go into the season with a new, without a new manager because I'll be impressed by how wrong I was. Let's move on to number three. The Derby countdown has begun. We have another Derby on our hands. Scottish Cup, last 16, coming up this Saturday. And it, there's a little bit of bite going into this game. And I, I, I do like to see it because it's been, you know, the Derbys have been a bit boring, especially the last one, which meant nothing because neither club really wanted to come out of there with a loss. And, you know, it was, it was just boring. This last 16 clash actually means something, you know. There's there's silverware on the line. And John Kennedy is throwing bombs right, left, and center into this game. So firstly, I want to touch on his comments after Livingston's game, Livingston game. So this is what he said. He said, I have full belief in the squad we have here that on our day, we are still the best team in the country, 100%. And I absolutely love to see that from John Kennedy because it is patently untrue. But, you know, you, you love to see him actually bigging up these players and after a 6-0 win, they probably deserved it. But again, where John Kennedy's wrong is the fact that, you know, maybe we are still the best team in the country on our day. Maybe we can get to that level, but why have we not? That's the, that that leaves more questions than, than it does answers because against Livingston, Celtic looked back to where they were 12 months ago. And you question why that wasn't the case for the whole season. What was wrong? What went wrong? Obviously, there were multitude of factors but why has it taken until april for celtic to play as good as they were last season and get back to that best squad in the country or best club in the country or whatever way it was john kennedy said it and you just got to question it you just got to question why what went wrong and why did it go wrong and why has it taken this long to fix it it genuinely worries me that celtic are playing this well because that means celtic had, had, has always had these performances in them and either the players weren't playing to the standard that they should be, the management structure was all over the place, and it took way too long to make the decisions to fix it. So that worries me going into it. But another thing that is obviously going on into this game is the talk about the Rangers 5. And I think the term the Rangers 5 is absolutely hilarious because it makes them sound like, you know, the Guilford 4 or something. The, you know, there were just players who broke lockdown procedures. And Going into this game, there's obviously a bit of bite. John Kennedy brought it up and said, you know, there's inconsistencies within the SFA, the way they're dealing with this, with the, the appeal not happening until after the game. Stephen Gerrard has come out and said, you know, yeah, I feel your frustrations, but again, I'm going to play my best players. And it's just, it really just falls on the F SFA here. I mean, from Rangers' perspective, from Stephen Gerrard's perspective, you get these players... If, if they're allowed to play, you're, you're going to play them if they're good enough. And I mean, you can't really blame them. They're not going to take that um, decision to themselves and ban their own players. Celtic didn't ban their own players after they came back from Dubai. I know Ball and Golly was treated differently. That was at the start of the season. But after the Dubai trip, you just got to say, like, you know, the, the only reason those Celtic players were out, the only reason they didn't play the week that they came back was because there was a COVID test. And the SFA didn't deal with it. There's always been inconsistencies with it within the SFA and a multitude of standards. And it's just, it's just a mess of an organization. I mean, I, I don't fall too strongly on this, to be honest, in terms of the Rangers players being banned because I mean, what are you going to do? They're not banned. So I, I, that's, that's, I think that's my biggest issue is that you have talking heads discussing 
whether or not they should be banned, why they should be banned. And of course, the Celtic side are saying <clears throat> that they should be. And of course, the Rangers side are saying they shouldn't be. And ultimately, they're not. So the anger should be directed at the SFA and why there are these inconsistencies in decisions in referees. And people can launch that at Celtic as well. I mean, we are at a real position of power because Rangers and Celtic are the strongest sides in the league. They're the richest sides in the league. They're the money bringers to the SFA. So there will always be inconsistencies in the way that these two clubs are treated. And which way you fall on that, depending on whether you think they are beneficial to Rangers or beneficial to Celtic, the likelihood is it's probably the team you support. So I, I genuinely don't see the point in arguing whether or not these five lads should be playing because they're going to be playing. So that's all you have to do. And you have to beat who's out in front of you. Celtic have always used the beating what is in front of you as the argument for how good they were. So if Celtic are really this good, if John Kennedy wants to say they're the, still the best team in the country, then they're going to have to beat this Rangers side, whether or not these five players are playing or not. So that's where I stand <laughs> on the Rangers five, as if they're the Guildford four or something dramatic has happened. They just broke lockdown procedure. So I don't even think it's that big a deal. I mean, it's happening right, left and center in the Premier League. It's going to happen. And, you know, these players just need to have more sense and know that they're in the public eye, know that they're being watched and know not to break the lockdown procedures. I mean, there's what, a couple of weeks left in the season. Just, you know, don't do it. It's, fairly stupid in my opinion that is the monday agenda for this week if there's anything that you want me to talk about on the monday agenda over the next couple of weeks there is a fairly you know fairly quiet couple of weeks coming in terms of content so if there's anything that you want me to touch on let me know in the comments below and again if you do like these videos and you want to see some more or you want to get notified every time they go live just hit the subscribe button it helps the channel grow and i really appreciate it as well thanks for watching